Welcome to this LSE Ideas discussion on achieving peace in an age of chaos, solutions for a sustainable future. My name is Mary Martin. I'm the director of the UN Business and Human Security Initiative at LSE Ideas. I'm joined by two distinguished thinkers and practitioners who both take a multi-dimensional view of global challenges of peace and sustainable development. And our discussion today is going to look at what we mean by these ideas and some novel ways of translating them into policy and practice. So let me begin by introducing them both. Steve Kilalea is a philanthropist who's focused on peace and sustainable development. From a successful career in technology and international business development, over the past two decades, Steve has applied his business skills to many philanthropic activities globally. Uh, he established the Charitable Foundation, which has over 3 million direct beneficiaries and is one of Australia's largest donors of foreign private foreign aid. He's also the founder of the independent think tank, the Institute for Economics and Peace, a nonprofit research institute known for its innovative analysis of the relationship between business, peace and economic development. Um, and it's used by many international organizations, including the UN, the OECD and World Bank. And um, here at LSE Ideas, we're very pleased and proud to work with IEP on, on our program. Steve's also the creator of the Global Peace Index, of which we will hear more later. This is the world's leading measure of peace that ranks 163 countries by their relative levels of peacefulness each year. And Steve's commitment to peace has earned him the Luxembourg Peace Prize, two Nobel Peace Prize nominations, and seen him named one of the top 100 most influential people in armed violence reduction. He's also the author of a new book um, about peace and sustainability, and hopefully you can see it, Peace in the Age of Chaos, which is out now, and there will be a link in the chat if you want to hopefully go and get it. Um, it's a very good read. It charts his work on peace and his insights into what it takes to build peace. Um, Steve um, is speaking to us, I think, from Australia, and um, perhaps, Steve, you can begin before we get into the conversation by telling us um, where exactly you're speaking from and how things are today with you. You're, if you need, if you unmute first. Thanks, Mary, and uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm speaking to you all from uh, Sydney, Australia, and uh, so down here, it's a little bit like a time warp in many ways. Very, very, very little COVID. Uh, we don't really have to worry. Uh, we only had six weeks of lockdown when we we're out of the office. The rest of the time we've been in it. But uh, at the moment, we've got a bit of a scare in Sydney with COVID. They uh, reported the, uh, 14 cases in the last the, uh, three or four days. And so that down here is considered serious. So, uh, and they'll get on top of it. They put lockdowns in the areas where it happens and I'm sure we'll give it a week and we'll all be gone again. And we're back to no cases at all. So it's a different world, quite a different world. Great to have you here. Um, thank you. And uh, we're also joined by Sabina Alkira, who many of you will know from her work on human security and human development building on the work of Amartya Sen. Sabina directs the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, which is a research center within the University of Oxford. Together with Professor James Foster, Sabina developed a method for measuring poverty that can incorporate different dimensions or aspects of poverty. And this has been applied to produce a global multi-dimensional poverty index, the MPI, as well as dozens of bespoke MPIs used as official national statistics. Um, Sabina previously worked at George Washington University, Harvard, the Human Security Commission and the World Bank. And she's speaking to us today from Bhutan, which I think is a first for, um, certainly for me, but for LSE Ideas. Um, having a speaker from Bhutan. So Sabina, before we get into the conversation, how are things with you and what are you able to tell us about the situation in Bhutan? 
No, thank you very much. Um, so it's, a, again, a, a low COVID place um, with very sadly one fatality from COVID through this pandemic um, with very proactive lockdowns when there are local occurrences, mainly through the southern border, um, but also a, a, a country that's very much hit economically by the cessation of tourism and the stoppage of the borders, the closure of the borders. And so it's a very interesting time of looking inward, thinking about the future, um, trying to create in different ways, lots of youth volunteers. Um, and it's a dynamic period, I think, for the country. Really interesting. Um, well, I'm sure we'll come on to more detail, but um, welcome to you both and thank you for joining us. Um, if you pull up your chat box, you will see um, some of the kind of housekeeping um, messages we're being recorded um, and this will be made into a podcast which will be up on the ideas website as soon as as we can there's a hashtag um, lse peace so please tweet and um, do all that you need to do on social media to to spread the word we'll we'll get on to questions obviously after we hear from both steve and sabina first but if you want to post questions in the chat or the Q&A function as we go along, that's absolutely fine. And we'll try and get to as many as possible at the end. So let me begin with you, Steve. Um, perhaps you're most associated uh, publicly with the Global Peace Index. Um, and we will come on to the whole art, if I might call it that, or science of measuring peace but you've just launched the latest 2021 Global Peace Index, uh, which I think once again puts Iceland at the top of the League of Peacefulness, um, but it also recorded a general decline globally in, in levels of, of peace. So perhaps you could start by telling us um, how you define peace and how we can all become Icelands, if you like, or in other words, uh, consistently peaceful societies. Over to you. Sure, that's okay. So uh, I'll talk for about maybe 10, 15 minutes in that range. No, please. Mm -hmm. uh, right, I uh, might start up and just come back and uh, talk, yeah, talk a little bit about the personal journey. So uh, as Mary mentioned, set up a, a family foundation probably about 30 years ago. It works for the poorest for the poor. It's about 3.6 million uh, direct beneficiaries now. We've done about 220 projects, but that took me into a lot of uh, war zones, near post war zones, because that's where a lot of the poorest people were. And I was actually in northeast Kabul in the Congo, which I think is one of the more dangerous places in the world. I was walking through there and I wondered, what are the most peaceful nations in the world? Searched the internet, couldn't find a thing. And that's how the Global Peace Index was born. But that creates a profound question because a simple businessman such as myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and it hasn't been done, then how much do we actually know about peace? If you can't measure something, can you truly understand it? If you can't measure it, how do you know whether your actions are helping you or hindering you in achieving your goals? You simply don't. I think the other thing which really struck me is just looking into a lot of these developmental projects we were doing, many, many different places. What I realised was that violence was intimately connected with poverty and a whole lot of other dysfunctional things. And that without peace, you'd never be able to achieve any sort of ability to be able to tackle the development goals we were really looking at. I think that was the other thing. So we look at the Global Peace Index, it's comprised of three different domains. So the first one is internal safety and security. So that measures things like homicides, a violent crime, level of policing, number of people in jail, levels of terrorism, state-sponsored terror on its citizens, political instability and such. The second is ongoing conflict, which is self-evident. So that's the intensity, number of conflicts within a country and also the number of deaths. And the third domain is militarization, which counts various aspects of militarization. So we'll bring the three of these together. There's 23 different indicators, most of them quantitative, some qualitative, to create 
the index. And that's how we sort of measure change. So I've just launched this year's one and global peacefulness just slightly deteriorated. In fact, it was the second lowest drop in 15 years we've been doing the index. And the things which fell were political instability and levels of violent demonstrations. They were two of the things with the biggest, biggest increases. So there were about 15,000 demonstrations last year. That's a 10 year trend, but militarization also deteriorated and that looks like it's reversed a decade long trend where militarization had actually been improving. I'll put that down to a lot of the geopolitical tensions between the, the NATO countries, the US and Russia, and then between the US, China, and many of China's neighbors in the Indo-China Indo Sea and the Pacific. So that's what I put it down to. Now, I could talk about this for ages, but I'm gonna move on very, very quickly. And so one of the things which is really important is to understand peace. So there's a number of different ways of looking at it. And what I've found is what determines the way you measure peace is your definition of peace. So we work with two types of definitions. The first is absence of violence or fear of violence, which gives us the global peace index. And that can be termed negative peace. Now, negative peace is fine, it tells you exactly where something is, its velocity and how it's going, but it tells me nothing about how to create a peaceful society. So to do that, what we do is we then use a whole lot of uh, mathematical modeling and statistics to determine the factors which are most highly associated with peaceful societies. And that we call positive peace. So the definition of that is the attitude, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. So we've got about 50,000 different data sets, indexes, attitudinal surveys and such down in Sydney, which we use to do all the statistical and mathematical modeling. And when we do it, what we come up with is then we use other statistical test techniques to clump the factors we find, and we get it down into an eight part topology. And so we call those the pillars of positive peace. And what's profound is we can now take that, turn it around into another index. I think the beauty of what we've done here, it's all derived through the mathematics and the statistics. It's not my ideas on what creates peace or what the researchers' ideas are on the creates peace. It's something we could say is empirically derived. And that's what makes the body of work, I think, really interesting. Now, what we do then, and this is profound, you can take it and now turn that round and create another index. We call that, naturally, positive peace index. What would be more fitting? So having a, that, having a positive peace index, we can now look at countries when you can assess the momentum on the things which create peace or the things which destroy peace. So now when we look at that, that gives us now a snapshot of how the world's faring. We can divide that into three different parts, attitudes, institutions, and structures. And so if we look over time, what we find globally is that the structures keep on improving. But structures for us are things like per capita income, uh, education levels, life expectancy, because they're all highly correlated with peace. But we look at the institutions and they're pretty much the same. Other than corruption, which is deteriorating globally, and well-functioning government, which is, I'll say, on the edge. Now, if we come and look at attitudes, they are deteriorating globally, and particularly in the Western democracies. And so this gives us the ability then to be able to look at this in a, in, in a bigger light, the ability to be able to now start to understand the momentum of nations and possibly where their future is going. So when we put this back into models, we've got ways of being able to look at the levels of peace, which is the actual peace through the Global Peace Index, the potential peace, which is through the positive peace, so if the positive peace is much lower than the actual peace, there's a deficit. By tracking that deficit, we go back a decade, we've been able to get an accuracy rate of 90% in countries which are likely to have substantial faults in peace. And that is truly profound. 
But now, positive peace in many ways is a transformational concept. Because if you look at positive peace and we come back and do more analysis, we find it's associated with many of the things which we desire and think are important in societies. So this eight pillar topology is associated things with higher per capita income, better performance on environmental measures, better performance on measures of happiness, well-being, better measures on measures of resilience and also inclusion. So in many ways, positive peace describes an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. If we look in the West, we've got a number of challenges at the moment. So we can see democracies on the decline. So measures of democracy, let's say by the Economist Intelligence Unit, are deteriorating. People's trust in democracies are down. Perceptions of corruption are up. Group grievances are up. Uh, Fractionalisation, particularly amongst the elites in society, is on the rise. Uh, a free press is the, uh, deteriorating. And also we can see rising inequalities as well. So we need new ways of being able to reinvigorate, re-envision our societies and positive peace does that. But positive peace doesn't act on its own. Positive peace is systemic. So what I'm gonna do is just now, just go through a couple of aspects of the you know, systems thinking, and then I'll probably stop on this stop on this part of the presentation. So we start to think of the world, and this is, philosophically very deep. So if we think of the world and the way we see it, it's in cause and effect. So, and if we look at empiric science and the great advancements we've come out of it, it's understanding cause and effect. So you have a cause, it creates an effect, but the effect doesn't influence the cause. That's the basis of physics. And that's why you have experiments which are repeatable. Now, that understanding of cause and effect in physics is built deeply into our subconscious. That's how we can walk down the street, we can throw a ball in the air and catch it, and it all works, actually, in subconsciously. But systems work very, very differently. So the systems, the effect influences the cause. That's called a mutual feedback loop. And just to bring it into perspective, I want you to think of three things, and these are three pillars from positive peace. I want you to think of well-functioning government, correct, corruption, free flow, free, free flow of information. So now it's the free flow of information affect corruption and well-functioning government. What does corruption inhibit the free flow of information and well-functioning government? Or does well-functioning government control corruption and control free flow of information? You can't pull the causality apart. And so that then means you need different ways of looking at systems. Politically, we think in terms, here's a problem, what's the cause, let's fix the cause and we'll move on. But that is somewhat effective and nothing more. So quite often, to, we try and parachute in solutions. We work a solution and put it into a situation with a little understanding of the situation. There's a concept of path dependency. Leo Tolstoy referred to it as the flow of history. And what it means is that all societies are on their, on their path. And what one needs to do is understand the path before making change. And then it's multiple nudges, small nudges from many, many different directions, if you like, looking through these lenses, these eight lenses of positive peace, to understand how to make change. Similarly, within societies, there's tipping points. We find it with corruption, we find it with per capita income, and we find it with many, many other things as well. So small changes makes a little difference. Till you get to a point, then small changes make vast differences. We can see that, let's say, with corruption. And we keep looking on this concept of homeostasis. Systems are always trying to regulate, regulate and find a homeostasis position. And that is, comes about through looking the way things come into a system, analysing it, determining whether there's a need for change. So if you think of a medical system, and we go back to pre-COVID, it was pretty much functioning along. There was a certain amount of money spent per capita on the, on the health system. It'd just keep moving forward. People would get sick, they'd get fixed. COVID arrives, and it's a shock to the system. So what that does is change what's in turn the coded norms in the system. 
So from there, the system now struggles to find a new homeostasis. And that's happening, not just in the health, it's happening in our political systems. And it's also happening in our economic systems on the, advent, on the back end of COVID. There's much more, which I could talk now, but what I'd like to say, positive peace provides a platform for transformational change, something which is really needed in this current age of chaos. Thanks, Mary. Steve, that's that's great. Good good start to to our discussion, and I think this idea that um, taking a systems approach to to peace and unpacking it into different <coughs> elements and how they interact, um, I think that takes us on very much to Sabina's work, which obviously is focused on on poverty and human development. We all work, I guess, with different labels, you know. Um, Steve, you and I have explored the, the overlaps between positive peace and human security and how that kind of fits together. And, and Sabina, tell us how your view, your perspective from your work on poverty as a multidimensional uh, phenomenon and the idea of human development, how that fits with, with Steve's systems approach. No, thank you so much, Mary. Um, our work takes its inspiration initially from many different actors, but Amartya Sen put it well when he said, you know, poor people's lives are battered and diminished in many and various ways. But that in a sense encapsulates what has been found by many, many um, colleagues who have done participatory work and asked people living in poverty who self-identify and are so identified by their community as impoverished or whatever the local term is, asking them what that condition means. And of course, when they supply answers, they're not all the same, they're diverse, and you can't generalize perhaps in a, in a very simple way. But there are some commonalities across many, many situations that there are different dimensions that pertain to that condition of impoverishment. Uh, and these would include health, education, and living standards, perhaps what might be considered you know, core aspects of human development as well from the Human Development Index, but also many others. And so one of the links comes from the 1999-2000 study, uh, Voices of the Poor, that the World Bank did for their World Development Report the next year. And one of the surprises from the Voices of the Poor study is that when they did this open-ended um, in participatory work to understand the different dimensions of ill being, then there were a couple surprises. And one was the prevalence of violence, that the experience of violence, the experience of being vulnerable to violence, whether criminal or conflict related, um, was pervasive in a way that hadn't been expected by economists thinking about poverty. And the other was humiliation, that being treated as if one is dirty, as if one is second class with indignity, um, that that actually also had almost a physical effect. And people working on social connectedness say it's experienced by the brain in the same way as physical pain. But these kinds of bottom-up approaches to defining poverty bring us directly into the ambit of positive peace. It is also the case that when you use poverty measures, Poverty can be highest in some of the conflict and conflict affected states, but not necessarily so. There will also be states at peace with high levels of poverty. But there is a, a complex conversation between these different dimensions. So what I've learned from Peace in an Age of Chaos and this um, treat, treatise, in a sense, that Steve is, has worked on and offered to us, is that there's a lot of work to be done just in a sense to mend the language that we have. And so that the words of positive peace and the words of um, systems thinking come in to the poverty reduction uh, areas. So let me give a couple examples. Um, first of all, just to take a step back, as those on this will have already seen, uh, there's a wonderful ability to communicate. So in talking about the Global Peace Index, obviously they're metrics, but they're also human stories, personal stories. They're observations from history, Tolstoy, 
but also Hammurabi, also Gandhi, also Bodhisattvas, all of Leaf peace societies, many others learning how others have addressed, in a sense, the same subjects. Um, there's bringing in very futuristic um, technologies and information on the size of the universe and an octillion of stars. Um, and so this wider aspect um, puts the work of building peace in a different perspective. And so for those who work on human security, on national security, on issues of peace and conflict, the book Peace and Age of Chaos actually begins in a much broader canvas. And I think rather than leaping over that, it would be good to pause and think um, again. For example, I was caught by the, the fact that one of the associations of the word peace was silence. And I hadn't really thought about that. Um, and also Steve's comment that peace is an enabler. It's a primary con condition that enables people to have a better opportunity to flourish. But in all of the work on well-being and all of the interest now in subjective well-being, but also in multidimensional well-being, I think this appreciation of the structures of positive peace perhaps isn't, isn't as evident. And then also in, in what Steve already said in, in his presentation about taking small steps um, about resilience and that those being, in a sense, more efficacious than a revolution, um, that could also be quite interesting when one comes to human development to peace and, or, sorry, to poverty and, and thinking about the processes of change and not simply the policies, not simply the budget allocations, but taking this, this joined up perspective and seeing poverty, even if it is multidimensional, in conversation with other priorities of the countries and other institutions. So I think that these are just a, a few of the different linkages um, conceptually between these. I think what they share is a, is a concern to protect people from threats to their well-being, threats to their very survival, and to create enabling conditions so that people can flourish. And beyond that, I think policy has a limit. So people have to take the last mile, last kilometer themselves um, to, to actually use that space in a creative and productive way. I think the other conceptual um, link that I just wanted to, to bring out a little bit was the need for and, and I think the, the term positive peace may not be understood, but, it, but in the book, Peace in an Age of Chaos, it says that this is a context and backdrop from which a new phase of thinking can arise and gain traction. And so it's offering not just a way of building peace country by country, saving money, looking at the economic cost of violence or the economic cost to GDP growth of violence, but also um, trying to have a new phase of thinking of creating these enabling conditions. And I think here is where the work on positive peace can join with human development, but they both need to go beyond in three ways. One is obviously to look at the subjective to join up with that and understand um, how these three different literatures that in academia at least tend to walk in separate paths um, are interrelated. A second is to think about professionals, not simply about um, human development and flourishing as something that governments do for their people, but also that as professionals do in their work, how colleagues can manage it. And there, there's good language in the book on um, having ways of managing conflict before it becomes dysfunctional. And that needs to happen at a micro level as well as um, between states or, or disagreeing parties. Um, and the third, I think, is the, the need, in a sense, for all of us to broaden our thinking to include the environment, the anthrop Anthropocene, to recognize the limitations and um, the largeness of the universe, but also the largeness and the potential destruction of, of humankind in our current stage, and so the need for this new phase. So those are the overlaps I see, and I think that they're exciting and maybe would be uh, good to connect these literatures much in a much more articulate way in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina, for um, a, an excellent kind of um, drawing together of some of the big um, conceptual overlaps. And I'm very much in sympathy with your, your phrase early on, we need to mend the language. So often we trip over, don't we, the different kinds of ways of articulating what is often the same thing, but we stick in our kind of disciplinary or professional silos. And I think it... Um, it behoves us all to, 
to examine those overlaps and not compete, but try and see where, where they fit together. And I think for me, um, the, the really, and obviously I suppose for me, from what I do and what we do in our project, it's, um, it's this importance of bringing the, the human back in, bringing that bottom up approach. So I wanted to throw that back to you, Steve, in the sense of um, both of you actually are, are engaged in, in trying to turn um, an idea about what peace is. And as, as you've both said, the, the, what are the enabling conditions for both peace and humans to, to flourish? Um, but you're also engaged in actually a very empirical positive exercise of measurement. And to what extent does that, in trying to measure and trying to capture something with statistics and so on, Steve, do you ever feel a tension that somehow the human gets written out of that exercise? Or can we reconcile, you know, those two functions, thinking about peace as a systems approach, but also thinking about it in terms of individual lives and human stories? Well, in many ways, Mary, I think it comes back to the individual. The approach line, the empathetic approach, whatever you do, your outcomes generally will be reasonably positive. So you can start with all the knowledge in the world. We can start with all the right language in the world. And we see this reflected in politicians again and again and again. They'll say one thing, get into government, and do something totally different. So the framework is a framework. It's how you apply it, it's which really counts. So what we've done with the positive peace framework and these eight pillars, you can use it on literally any community development project. And so there's a number of principles which we'll bring into play. And I'll give you one clear example too, of one we did in Uganda. So look, my experience out of all the work, work I've done, I've got plenty of examples, like personal stories through the book on this, but I won't go into detail on them now. We have just seen people in horrendous environments. Once they're given a little bit of power, like in this case, the sort of money and knowledge, they really know what they need best. I kind of think most people do know what they need best, unless they're really unless they're really dysfunctional. So the idea of the framework, which you can take a project, and we'll, we'll move into one which is a clear example. Here's a school, a school in Uganda. So you take the eight pillars, and now you look at the project through each of those pill, each of those lenses, and say, what's interventions which I could do which makes the most meaning? Now, you want to do things which are something which are reasonably substantial. You've got to do something which you can actually do in the political environment. Okay, there's a lot of places, and this is part of dependency, the, uh, the, the context of the culture or the establishment will stop certain things from actually ever happening because they they're fit outside the moral bounds of the society or they fit outside the power structure. So you need something you can actually do. You want to do it in a reasonable amount of time. But more importantly, each of those interventions need to come out of the community. You can have a facilitator, but you really don't want the facilitator coming in and saying, well, in the West, this is what we do. Okay, or well, this is the values we have. You need the community to build it up. And sometimes they'll be counterintuitive to us. It may not even be things we particularly uh, like, but it's the part dependency of the society so you look at acceptance of the rights of others. The idea is to move it forward from where it is, not to take it, an astrological jump to another planet. So we'll come back to the school in Uganda. So there was a guy who attended some positive peace training we did down in Uganda at least, oh, maybe five, six years ago. Yeah, it could be longer, seven years now. And basically, so he did two trainings, two, two courses with us. And after that, he then decided that, well, I'll go and apply it to this project, which was getting run through his local Rotary Club, which was literacy into a very, very poor village. And what he found is he started to apply the pillars, they work. So one of them is free flow of information. So they went along to the local radio station, talk about what they were doing in the school and their approach. But they, 
low levels of corruption. They sort of created a register of everything donated to the school and then stamped everything with something on it belonging to the school and then checked the register every three months. Well-functioning government was simply providing the local elders and the school principals in the design of the project, so they were involved. But the two things which really made a difference on this project, the first was acceptance of the rights of others. So there were girls in the school and they weren't going to uh, you know, school four days a month, simply just they were menstruating. So the introduction of pads, and that's nothing new, but looking at through the various lenses, you come to it pretty easily when you're looking at acceptance of rights of others. The second one, and this was really quite profound, was looking at good relationships with neighbours, because that's one of the other lenses of positive peace. So what they found is there's a little, this school was an incredibly poor area in a rural environment, and there was a lot of trouble with the neighbours. The neighbours didn't want the school there. And what was happening is the kids at lunchtime were going out and raiding the fruit trees in the surrounding area to get something to eat because they were hungry. So what they did is they planted fruit trees in the yard, then introduced some porridge feeding at lunchtime. And that only cost a couple of cents a person. So it's easy for the Rotary Clubs to afford it. And what that did over the course of two years, they increased the attendance in the school by 240%. And they had the number of people getting the top two grades at 60% of the students in the school compared to it being 30% before. And what happened with the feeding was now the kids had it, what was happening is because they weren't getting any food, they'd get to lunchtime and after lunch, their brains had just cycled down. They didn't have the nutrients to keep it firing. That meant the brains could keep firing. When they put it out in the, uh, through the local radio station, parents then decided to send their kids to school because this is an incredibly poor environment. It was one less meal they had to give. And so that's an example, just taking it and applying it in, in a local setting. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I think those kind of stories really, and and certainly they're through throughout your book. Um, they do bring it home, and I think that balance between the, the the kind of pillars, which from what you're saying, Steve, they sort of work in every cultural context. I mean, they may sound quite you know social scientific to us, but they resonate wherever you are, whether it's Uganda or. or um, you know, Latin America or so on. Um, if I can sort of turn the same question in a way to, to you, Sabina, because you mentioned in your remarks about the need to, uh, well, the importance, those two factors that came out of the Voices of the Poor um, study, uh, one which was violence, which I guess we can, we can all understand, but the very important dimension of, of humiliation and, and dignity, and then the need to be more subjective. How does that work in your work? How do you incorporate those kind of stories and subjective feelings? Because I know the kind of remarks often we get um, about human security is that it's, um, you know, it's fleeting perceptions. It's not real kind of empirical evidence. So do you chafe against that or how do you incorporate it, uh, that subjective element in your work? No, that's a very good question. Um, so we primarily create numbers. And so I would tip my hat to Steve because he's very good at weaving in stories. And in the book, he says, the problem with statistics is that they are just statistics and they lack emotional resonance and personal narratives. But I'll just speak from my comfort zone, which are statistics. <laughs> um, so first of all, let me give you a concrete example from El Salvador. El Salvador um, obviously had lots of high homicide rates in the mid 2000, yeah, around 2013, 2014, when they started to design their multidimensional poverty index. And they did participatory work and the government already designed a draft and the communities came back um, and wanted to put in violence. And then there was a, a conversation, um, mediated conversation about whether or not that should go in because whether or not the government could actually look at 
you know, criminal violence, other kinds of violence, and say that they could make a promise to reduce it. Um, but in the end, it did go, go in. And so um, we used, or they used, um, questions that had already been tested by the UNODC, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, and Victimization Surveys, to try to obtain objective information on incidences of violence, um, whether criminal, conflict, or, or other kinds. And that a move to incorporate violence in some settings has occurred in a number of other countries um, using different kinds of questions. Um, uh, but um, tending towards the objective ones, although in um, some, something like the Afghanistan survey for their national MPI, they also say, you know, have you experienced um, different kinds of shock of which one is a, a violence related one from which you have not recovered? So there's an S, a, 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 a self-report aspect to the questions. But humiliation, of course, or social cohesion or social capital are more difficult. And they're more difficult to include in a measure because they can change for two reasons. One is the objective conditions of which this is a proxy um, could change. Um, and that, so there might have been a, pov a positive policy fighting discrimination, for example, but it created a lot of awareness about discrimination. And so the reported humiliation or discrimination might have risen. And so um, when that happens, then the trend would show an increase when actually it might have been a decrease. And so when those kind of uh, indicators are included in poverty or well-being indices, they tend to be included with a light weight. Um, so an index has different weights on different indicators. And the reason is that then they are visible, you look at them, but if there's a change of reference phenomenon, which we've seen in a number of, of periods, then it's not going to, the, the politicians wouldn't be afraid to put them in because it might be um, just a, a measurement um, attribute instead of actually an underlying increase in a deprivation. So those are the, the measurement ways of dealing with them. And um, I suppose also a question for, for both of you who are uh, involved, engaged in, in producing indices at the end of the day, these, these measurements. Um, how should they be used then and by whom? I mean, Sabina, I think you mentioned um, the role of professionals, you know, who is using these and um, who, who does this work. So how, what is your kind of wish for, for what happens to your index and indices when, when you've compiled them so, so thoroughly? I mean, what are the action points that can arise out of them? myself Sorry? to myself yes if you start okay. and i'll come back to steve on on the same question okay so for multidimensional poverty measures with james foster um our work was in a sense sparked by a demand from a country and so from the very beginning we knew that this was not just an academic exercise with lots of axioms and mathematical properties but it had to be easy to understand and it had to be policy relevant and it had to pass the small smell test and that grandmothers who look at it have to say, yes, that's, that, 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 that seems right. And so um, that was from the very beginning, I think an aim in, in finding metrics that would fulfill both the academic standards and, and the usability standards. And so one audience is certainly the policy actors um, often in a government and they tend to use multidimensional poverty metrics. Um, first of all, to look at trends and to complement monetary poverty statistics um, because many countries already have monetary poverty measures. And so this is a sister that actually is often different. And so there might be a region with high mining, so low income poverty, but poor infrastructure, so very high MPI. And again, people know that that is the case, whether it's in East Papua, whether it's in Gaza, whether it's in Silhet, but um, having a metric helps to capture what needs to be done to fix it. The second use is um, really budgeting um, and here the multidimensional poverty measures are disaggregated by rural, urban, by ages, for children, by subnational regions, by province or district, um, by people with a disability, by ethnic minorities. So you can slice and dice it as in any way that the data permits. And so that enables budgeting to adjust or policy to adjust to the level of poverty and the face, the indicator composition of, of poverty of the different ones. And then the, the third hope is basically coordination. And that's a big overlap with Steve's work um, and his focus on collaboration. Because if there's a shared 
goal, like a, an index. It takes a team to drive the ball down the field. And so getting the ministries to work together and they might compete in other spheres, they will. But when it comes to poverty or peace, it's important enough to work together. And so I think that coordination with a clear informational structure is useful. And the last would be really to invite the private sector, which has come in in a big way with poverty work, um, NGOs, other actors. And so for that, the measure has to be simple so that it can be done in an online survey so that communities can do their own measures um, so that students can do it in their work. Um, and so that's a little bit um, of, of the ways we hope the work will be used. So yes, used for policy, but it has to be understood more broadly than that. That's, that's an excellent segue, thank you, because one of the questions I wanted to ask Steve as a businessman was about the private sector as well. And, you know, but let me just backtrack a second to say, um, so with the, the, the Global Peace Index, Steve, and um, we've seen um, a small decline in, in general levels this year, um, other interesting features like a rise in militarization, uh, we've got the terrorism indicator. So for you, where, how do you see that being used? What do you want to come out of it? Are there particular tipping points at which moment should we become concerned that the level of militarization, for example, is going up or the level of general global peacefulness is going down? And then perhaps come on to the, the private sector aspect as well, please. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, sure, Mary. Uh, so what we find is most, most all the major multilateral organizations use this in some shape, way or form. So we do a lot of contract research for a lot of them, which springs out of the development of indexes, and sort of also around the economics of violence or the economics of peace and development. So like UN, World Bank, Commonwealth Secretariat, uh, the, uh, the Commonwealth, yeah, Commonwealth Secretariat, uh, just to name some. Uh, we've also worked with a lot of different development agencies as well. They adopted, and they adopted, particularly in the areas where they were interested in peace, and we've got peace projects. So they, because a lot of them are struggling with having some unified way of being able to a, a look at a theory of change around the work they do for peace. There's a lot of work on instrumental project programs they can do, but not a lot on which gives them a a really solid empirically based theory of change. So the positive piece comes in, in that area. Uh, NGOs, so we, we Rotary International, for example, the uh, uh, standardized on a positive piece to roll out through the 1.3 million members. Uh, Religions for Peace, a multi, multi faith organization, largest multi faith organization in the world working on peace. They've standardized on it and they're rolling out training sessions out around the world. That'd be another example. Uh, now, we come down, it's also used by financial institutions, okay? So we've got, a, 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 it's used by a, a, a MSCI, Morgan Stanley Composite Indexes. They're the leading financial indexes in the world. They use it to develop a whole lot of ESG. Indexes, the uh, you know, Global Peace Index has incorporated that in part of the ESG measures. We've had other financial companies uh, yeah, standardize on the uh, positive the, uh, peace and produce the uh, uh, equity funds, which are based called Positive Peace Global Equity Fund, for example. So we've got a group called EC Poll out of Australia, which have done that, and we're looking at launching a billion dollar fund around that. So the works also influence there. We find it's also used in, by many different financial institutions to now look at the potential for future, future financial return. So for example, positive peace, countries which are improving compared to countries which are deteriorating at three times higher GDP growth rates. Inflation rates are half, interest rates are half, Volatility in inflation is six times less. You'll find that countries which are improving in positive peace, their exchange rates improve on average about 1.3 pence per cent per annum, compared to countries which are deteriorating in positive peace where the exchange rates fall. Foreign direct investments double in countries improving in positive peace compared to ones which are falling. So I think one of the other offshoots of the work we've done, we haven't really touched on is being able to take all this stuff and quantify it in financial terms. 
So each year with the Global Peace Index, we got 18 different metrics we used to calculate the cost of violence to the global economy. And in 2020, that came in at nearly $15 trillion, 11.6% of global GDP. We can only count what we can count. There's a lot of stuff we can't count. So that figure could be 50% high. But if we look at it, the major component, 40% of it, is military. So if we could just reduce the military by 10%, we'd go a long way. So I've just put this into perspective. So if you look at $15 trillion, you took 1% of that, that's about 1.5, sorry, it's about 100. $150 yeah, billion. So it's pretty close to all overseas developmental aid. 10% reductions like adding three new economies to the world the size of Ireland, Denmark, and Switzerland. So we're never going to have a world which is tastefully peaceful. I don't know if it's within the capabilities of the emotional range of human beings, but we certainly can imagine a world which is 10% more peaceful. There's a lot of money in that which can then alleviate a lot of suffering. Well said. Um, if we think about um, going back to who, who, uses, who uses this information and the numbers and how we can get that ethos, um, uh, particularly the kind of systems approach and the multidimensional approach into the right categories of people to operationalize it. Do, do you think, Steve, there is enough, if you like, professionalization of peace, um, say, amongst um, policymakers, but also the private sector? I mean, with that, you obviously talked about militarization. And if you, if you contrast that, you know, we have very professional across the world military establishments with training and, um, and expertise. There isn't the same effort, is there, going into kind of Peace. How do we start to address that? Because I think that was also, if I'm reading you right, Sabina, that was what you were referring to at the beginning. And you know, who does this? Who does it work for? Is that for me or for yeah, Sabina? No, please go ahead. Do you, what, do you have a view on how we get this done? Yeah. Look, I th look. I think this is really difficult. Okay. And like again, societies are on these. Path, depend, path dependency uh, moving down. So we went back. So when I first did the Global Peace Index, I turned up as a naive Australian in Washington, and everyone said, look, drop the word peace. You can't use it here in the States. You just can't use it. We talk about human security. And I know you resonate with this one very well, Mary. So you use, drop it. We call it the violence index, that's okay. And I thought, no. Peace is what I want to do. So now if we look at the path dependency on it, you go back to the 60s, okay? And so you've got John Lennon, who I loved as a musician, full on with peace. So people who are into peace, anti-establishment, anti-business, anti-globalisation, and anti, it was more about what they were against than what they were for. And so that had this sense of coming through that anyone who was interested in peace was impractical. My whole aim was to take measurement and drag it back to the middle ground. So now today, you don't get too many arguments that the uh, war is good for business, okay? And it's not just our work, it's other works like Joe Stiglitz and, and such, but it's, you don't get too many people arguing that anymore. The, the dime is changing. And most business people I know, they get the issues facing the planet today. And I think in my lifetime in business, that's the big swing. Last 20 years, right at the very top end of business, most people want a sustainable planet. So, like you, so, so you've got those swings there. The policy problem with policymakers, and in this area, I'm probably talking more politicians, is politicians do instruct their departments in the end. They're more, we're, they're more interested in the election cycles and the short termness for them the long term projects. So the issue is really sort of you need a society to become literate around the changes we make, the slow, 
over a longer over long periods of time. We're talking 10, 20, 30 years. It's the same, I'm sure Sabine will feel the same about reducing multidimensional poverty. You can't come in and do it in five years. It's a long process. You've got to change the way people think. And we've got to need to change the way our governments operate. But one of the good things, one of the really good things is the issues with climate change. It's getting people to start to think systemically. They are actually starting to think longer. So for me, it's how do you take these long-term concepts, social development, or the societal developments, and plug them in around that so that we actually now start to actually move in a more systemic way moving forward. But I think I still think we've got a long way to go in the education. I think the work you're doing there with your group, Mary, is excellent and sort of the CEO very good in that regard. I'm, I'm amused to say that you got that reaction in Washington because we, we often get the same one. People say to us, oh, don't come and talk about human security because nobody understands it. So <laughs> I think there is just uh, indicates a kind of resistance to, uh, to new ideas. Maybe Sabina has done better in her field <clears throat> with human development, which I think starting to, to really gain traction about um, we can't just measure things in GDP. We have to, um, you know, we have to invert the, um, the, the, the metric, if, if you like. But I guess we cannot avoid in any discussion like this um, the C word. And so I wonder what happens, has happened to both your work um, uh, in the last year with, with COVID, not in a, in a practical sense, although I was obviously fascinated to hear that, but how do you think that the pandemic changes the dynamics of, of what we understand by peace and what we can all agree needs to be done? Um, Sabina, maybe you just want to kick us off with that one and come back to you, Steve. How does COVID change the concept and the operationalization of all this? So our bit in, in, during the pandemic has been to carry on working on poverty, but what we found, we work with many, many different governments and also with some of the multilaterals, but the people that we work with had to pivot and work on the COVID emergency responses for the poor. And so it's been a fascinating um, period since March 2020 of, first of all, struggling against data limitations. So reanalyzing data, looking at vulnerability right before the pandemic, doing simulations, trying to assess what has happened um, before there were any data during the pandemic. And then of course, um, as the remote phone surveys and things came out, trying to understand them, work them, analyze them. But the, the policy aim has been, you need data in order to act because resources are constrained. And so what is the best use of that resources in terms of targeting households, targeting sectors, targeting regions of the country? Um, to have uh, a supportive environment. And this while people are migrating right and left. And so even, you know, the censuses and, and the maps of where people live may are in some countries are out of date. Um, I think another very positive thing from COVID has been the innovation. And it's, it's not been us, it's been the, the folks we work with. But for example, Colombia had a recent census and they got permission to merge their census, which has a multidimensional poverty index in it with health records if people had the underlying conditions that would make uh, infection quite serious. And then they overlaid it with data on health um, facilities. And so, and they kept updating that with COVID uh, data. And so they had sort of an online geospatial map down to the block level of what was happening and trying the, therefore to control the pandemic using data. So these innovative merging of data sources, innovations in terms of data collection, um, during the pandemic by phone, by other options. I think that's been a very, very positive thing. But I, I guess the last hope that I have, and it remains a hope, but it's a quite, a, quite a strong one because I see it in many of the leaders we work with, is that this will actually prove to be an inflection point. Um, we often cite Amartya Sen, April 15th. Um, he wrote an article in the Financial Times about World War II in Britain, um, where he observed that in the decade before, um, the 1940s, life expectancy had risen 1.2 years for men, 1.5 years for women. But during um, the decade of the war, because of rationing, a very simple policy, um, primarily, 
life expectancy rose by six and a half years by men and, and seven by women. And so with simple but emphatic policies that are equalizing and that really do protect um, some of the vulnerable, um, that there can be historic changes. And we found in work that we released last year with UNDP for 5 billion people in six, 75 countries that the fastest reduction of any country in any period was Sierra Leone from 2013 to 2017, which were the years of the Ebola pandemic. And so many things go wrong. Everything has to be done so quickly. There's not enough information. And yet um, it, it worked. And so there was a, a, a very, very fast reduction from 74% to 58% of people being poor. And so the hope is that um, with the visibility of some of those who are struck in the worst possible way by the pandemic, that this will uh, create a reaction that could create an inflection point. But what we think is that that doesn't just need metrics, it also needs leadership and passion. And, and that when that's activated and communicated, then, um, then things might better align. Really interesting your example from from Colombia because that's empowering as well, isn't it? Because you need that data from the ground and and people giving their stories and their actual experiences to kind of motivate that that change based on on real time and real experience data. So that that's something different from what we had 10, 15 years ago, where the only data being collected was at sort of national or even international level. So. That I find in, encouraging. Steve, what's your take on, on what COVID does? How does that impact on, on positive peace and how you, how you go about um, operationalizing it? Sabina, I just thought they were great stats. They're just stunning. That's the most positive thing I've heard on COVID so far. Wow, I'm gonna take that away and regurgitate them, I think. So our take on it, I'm afraid, from a peace perspective, is nowhere near as positive. So what we've seen is that when the, the, the lock, when COVID started, you started to get the lockdowns and restrictions on access for people. Violent crime dropped, demonstrations fell right off. There's probably rise in probably domestic violence and also in suicides. But we haven't got enough data to really clearly understand that. You'd have to infer it, I think. Uh, uh, but the violent crime and demonstrations, that was short-lived. Uh, we got, by the end of 2020, they were well back to where they were prior to the pandemic. We found that in violent demonstrations, a, there were three times as many countries deteriorated on the measure of violent demonstrations has improved. And political instability, twice as many countries deteriorated as improved. So we come back and look at the violent demonstrations, there are about 15,000 worldwide. About 5,000 violent COVID incidences worldwide. And an incident doesn't necessarily equate to a violent demonstration, but 50% of it would. Uh, and so what we can see is a 10 year trend of increases in violent demonstrations. And so 2020 hasn't let up on that. And if we look globally, it just for so many different reasons. And this is a, this, this is a pointer to something else. So obviously you got the Black Lives Matters movement. You didn't only have it in the US, you had it in the UK, you actually had it here in Australia too. We saw a, a, a Indian farmers against the new agricultural laws there demonstrating. We've obviously got places like Belarus, the demonstrations there. You've got Myanmar and you've got the coup there and the ensuing demonstrations. You've got through Latin America, you've got a whole range of different demonstrations around economic austerity. Now, as we come out of the back of all this, what we're doing and what's sort of keeping the world afloat is just the pumping of money. That's either coming through uh, higher levels of debt or through concepts of quantitative easing, which is effectively governments printing money. So, like, and so that's muting a lot of the effects which we can see moving forward. Productivity prior to COVID had been flat for many, many years, or just slightly improving in some countries. So, all these, and we've, as I mentioned earlier on, we've got these measures, we've seen deteriorations. In sort of that's in sort of abuse of the abuse towards 
political democracy, corruption, the group grievances, the levels of the inequity and, su and, and such. So all these things, I think are going to, COVID is going to be a multiplier moving forward. So how much of a multiplier, whether it's 1.2 or whether it's 2, we don't know. We don't know. But we certainly, the next few years, as the money pump stops, and we'll have to stop at some stage, uh, uh, we get, we're going to have to come to reconcile with all this. And at that point, hopefully, that will be an inflection point where leaders now start to think, well, how do we go about doing things differently? Indeed. Um, we have time for questions and comments if any of you in the audience want to post those in either the chat or the Q&A, we can pick them up. Um, but I noticed there was a comment earlier from Alcina Jeffers who was making the point about employment as, as so crucial to both uh, poverty and, and peace and I guess it very much also touches on Sabina's point about dignity and personal lack of humiliation, um, self-worth. So, uh, and clearly uh, where we are with COVID is this awful uh, trade-off between public health, it seems, and, and employment and jobs and, um, and output in, in the economy. Um, is it that, or can we find ways of, of squaring the circle? What, what are your thoughts on the employment question and, and people's future of jobs, Steve? Also, I guess in this, in this matrix, if we're talking about multidimensional, we're heading into an era of uh, increasing um, technological change, artificial intelligence. Um, so this is creating all sorts of kinds of perfect storm of pressure and tensions on, on individuals and the prospects for peace. So what's your view on the kind of employment and jobs question out of this pandemic? So look, if we look back and we go back to the 80s, we had sort of runaway inflation. Stock market stayed flat. At stage then, they brought in a measure that uh, the full employment was roughly 5%. That's not the real Full employment rate, the real full employment rate is probably closer to two and a half to three percent or something like that. So there are certain people who just aren't capable of working uh, for, for, uh, because of the disabilities, because of the mental illness, uh, yeah, 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 and, 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 and other things. So, but what happens with an unemployment rate of five percent? It means that the bargaining power of the workers disappears. That's part of why we've seen an erosion in working conditions and wages over the last the, uh, 15 years or so. Now, with Australia, for example, the government's now trying to push unemployment under 5%. So where they're going with that, I don't know. The US, we've heard similar sorts of things coming out of the, out of the, out of the US as well. And so to some extent, there's a feel that we need some inflation back into society. Uh, so now, with that, that would be good for working conditions, okay, because then there'd be more power to the employer to bargain and wages would, in theory, go up. But you need with it an increase in productivity, otherwise it's just inflation. We all know where inflation goes in the long run. It makes for very unpredictable economic conditions you're making long-term investments, let's say, we're just looking at one small aspect of it. It makes money very, very expensive to borrow if you want to try and grow. So now, so there's a trade-off. So this is, the, the, yeah, Sabina's the economist, so she's obviously a lot smarter on this than me. But to, this is, so there's trade-offs here, okay? There's, a, there's this tension there between goodness and badness. But I think we need to start to think about full employment. I've just been reading a book called Hillbill Elegy. And it's about the erosion of the uh, middle class America in, in the old industrial towns. And what it's ended up with is being placed with dysfunction. So one of my lessons in life is most people are seeking meaning and they, human beings for some reason, unlike your dog or my cat, uh, 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 once they're full, 
They don't want to sleep. They want to do stuff. We want to be productive. And so there's something in that innate ability which we can pull on. As we move forward into the future, technology is increasing at an ever faster, ever faster pace. One of the things with new technologies, laws for management of that technology always come well after the technology, because you've got to see the problems before you can regulate. And you can see that, let's say, with the internet and social media now. We're just starting to see the first regulations come in. But as you get an increase in pace of the innovation, the backlog on the laws you need build up. I think that's an area very, very few people are even thinking about. Thinking about is how do you get to catch it? How, how do we get our regulations to match the rate of innovation? So I'm just noticing, let's say Turkey recently deployed the National Bazaar, the first to the autonomous, autonomous drones for killing soldiers on the field, okay? It, 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 it's, it, it's launching, it's called launch and forget. Okay, you just launch it in the sky, then you forget about it and just go off killing people. So we're there, there's no international norms around it. We're only just in the first phases of the discussion. Now, one of the other things I think too, I'm fairly optimistic on this one. I think as innovation will fuel changes in jobs, but we'll just see new jobs coming into existence, okay? Old jobs will disappear, new ones will come. And sure, we can produce more with less, but isn't that a good thing? Isn't that the course of human history over the last 5,000 years? So now, what are the new jobs of the future? They not, may not be rocket scientists. That may be involving in the service industries. One of the things I can see in my lifetime, which has radically increased, is the number of personal trainers, physiotherapists, masseuses, and so on. And that's all good stuff. It's all about being healthy, being well. Okay, so they're, they're good things. The key thing, the key thing, is they, that we do focus on improvements in productivity, and those improvements then get shared through everyone. Thank you. I have a question from Desmond Bowen, who asks, um, all this is about multidimensional change coming from different directions, top and bottom of society, from business and international governments and above all individuals. So his question is, is it possible to depoliticize this process or do we get uh, trapped back in that um, kind of whirlpool of, of um, what is what is desirable, what is wanted uh, politically. Sabina, maybe you could have a go at that. Um, how do you see it having to deal with politicians? It's quite fascinating because I am an economist and that was my training. And so it, it was completely baffling to actually realize that poverty statistics could be at all political. Um, so we've had to learn a lot. But basically what we try to do, we, we work some at the global level with UNDP, um, covering 5.9 billion people this year, but we work more with national governments. And there we are working to create an official national statistic. This is permanent. And that means it will be computed by this government and the next government and the one after that with changes of political party as well as of leaders. And so that's an interesting task because on the one hand, you need and want um, uh, leadership and just a very strong determination on the part of the current government to reduce multidimensional poverty and to do so visibly. And that can happen within five years. For example, Nepal cut its poverty by half, um, Bhutan in eight years, India in 10 years. So um, visible changes are possible within some electoral cycles. But on the other hand, you need to say that what could be politicized is how you address poverty, but not how you measure it, not whether or not it's a priority. It's how do you attack it? And so trying to keep that conversation open. And I must say, um, listeners on the call, ideas are welcome because we are always learning about how to do that. But basically, first of all, you need a technocratic core um, who are the geeks, who do the numbers and the surveys, and they are the continuity in some sense. But then when there is a change of government or political party, it's a matter also of trying to give the new leaders confidence that they understand the metrics, confidence that they realize it's not a, a, something that the last government had a, a, as a tripwire, 
but actually it could be useful. And I think these principles will be shared with Global Peace Index and the many national peace indices that IEP have done. And then, you know, to, to have ownership and sort of think about how they, with their new setup, will, will, will use the metrics. So uh, hopefully um, the politics can come in in terms of who are the actors and what particular programs policies work. But there's also a hope that the very, very functional policies like public schools or health systems, that those could carry on um, in some way as, as a core part of some societies where they, they are well functioning. Steve, I guess in more normal times, you would spend a lot of time in, in the US and clearly we're seeing there that all discussions uh, are incredibly partisan these days and, and polarized. What's your view on how easy or difficult it is to keep these, uh, keep a kind of general consensus around global public goods like ending poverty or, or improving peace? Yes, we, 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 we take, it's difficult, okay? We'll put it that way, difficult. So we've got a number of principles a, a, which we apply and that work fairly well for us. Where we get more of the political issues because people don't like their rank on the index. So I can't tell you how many ambassadors I've had in my office a, a, a complaining about their country's ranking. And like all they do is they get something from the foreign ministry to go in and see us and tell us the, uh, yeah, 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 why we got it wrong. And they come in, they don't actually know anything about the index. They just come in and make a position. So that, that part of it is, uh, that, that is that is quite political and you can't get around it. So that's, so now but in terms of being able to generally manage it, like with the uh, bipartisan thing, is one, is we talk the numbers, to we avoid a, a trying to take what we're doing and putting it into any sort of the uh, political setting. We really do our very, very best to avoid it. Places like the States is hard, uh, but partly because I've got a strong business background and find people on the uh, right side are attracted to me. They think I'm a no-nonsense business guy and someone they can get on with. So that, that, that business background I found been really helpful on that side. Uh, 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 they don't feel I'm in there sort of attacking them with the left wing, going to come in and attack them with the left wing agenda. The military, uh, we don't make a moral judgment on the military because obviously we don't live in a peaceful world. And so we do need, need military. And although we took money which was spent on the military, we directed that in other areas. We get more productive flow and effects from those investments. It doesn't mean you don't want a military because there's always going to be nasty countries. And without military, you'd never have any peacekeeping operations, would you? Where would South Sudan be now? So, or many, you know, East Timor, many, many, many other places. So part of it is, one is we, so even with President Trump, right through his tenure as president, we never put anything out which was critical of him, nor did we ever sort of, yeah, yeah, get, in, get more, attack any of the policies which he did. So we let the time, let the data as best we can speak, and then let people interpret the data. And people interpret it in different ways, but still the data doesn't underline the same story. You just can take different nuances and approaches from it. In that vein, uh, Joshua tell us, is it possible to create a uniform understanding of peace globally, given different narratives and interests? Um, do, do you need a kind of one definition? I know we've struggled with this on, on human security, a kind of sub level, you know, and we go back to the UN definition now as a kind of, you know, the, 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 the chapter and verse on it, but peace is a much more flexible, malleable um, idea. Do you think it would benefit from, and is it possible to create a uniform understanding? Uh, I think you've got to look at the way, the lens through which you're looking. Uh, so look, if we're looking at personal peace, we can see that as the absence of afflictive emotion, if you like. Or you know, I think the word science has been used right at the very, very beginning of this. So that's, and so if you're looking at personal peace yourself and your definition there, so that's very, very different. So we use peace when a war starts. And that's 
pretty good, okay? Because let's face it, if you've got a war on and it stops, that is peace. And peace is relative. It's it's not a, it's, a, it's not an absolute term. It's only relative to something else. So you're more peaceful or less peaceful than something else. Look at look at our own nations internally. None of us are a, a, a totally at peace, but none of us are totally at war internally. We've got our afflictive emotions, and sometimes they're stronger, sometimes they're weaker, and other times we've got our positive emotions. So and peace is the same. So for me. And this is why we come back to those couple of definitions. Understand the utility factor which peace has, then create a definition, and now you've got something you can apply to it. Otherwise, it's an amorphous concept, and the, in many ways, peace is just the absence of something. It's an event which didn't happen. Um, and perhaps a final question. Um, uh about education and whether you need peace education. So Helena Maruja asks, how do you see the role of peace education in the processes that you've been talking about? And very specifically, she says, does a peace ranking in schools, schools currently only have performance rankings, does that make sense? Sabina, do you have a view on how education on the, on the part that education plays in in your work on poverty and human development well i, I know that steve does a lot of, of teaching and training on peace and that's uh, probably more directly relevant to helen's question but very quickly on poverty um, we do a technical summer school and technical courses in many countries for statisticians and people who want to roll their sleeves up and dive into the data but we also do policy training courses. Um, we're starting an executive education course this year. We have a MOOC with UNDP. Um, so we do have lots of different channels open because it's really important. It's important um, to have the person who does the numbers and their boss and their boss's boss, who's actually gonna ask for the numbers. And then the uh, technical assistant of the boss's boss, who's going to have to interpret them and then link them to policy. And so you need really different channels of training so that a, a whole community of actors is aware at the level of, of, of their interest about how the work is relevant to them. Steve, what about a peace ranking in schools? And tell us a little bit finally about the work that you do in, in, in at the education level. Sure, I think, look, if you're looking at a peace ranking within schools, uh, you could do it, you could do it. The, the question is what, would be the value of this to rank one school against another because you, it's going to come out and you're going to find that the socioeconomically economically deprived areas the ones which are going to have the worst ranking you're going to find that the elite schools the ones which are going to have the best ranking that's pretty much the way i, I envisage it would turn out uh, uh, now you might be able to determine whether you've got progress within the school or not but what are you going to use as the measures okay how do you go about doing it so is it something which a, a, the education department sits and determines what should be the measure? So is it the kids within the school? And it's the measurements within the school. The kids in the different schools come up with a different idea of what's what they think is important. So and at this point, uh, well, I've done a hell of a lot of measurement on peace and a little bit, uh, you, you, you need to think it through a lot more and need to understand sort of what was the Utility, what, what's the purpose of measuring peace in school? What do you want the outcome to be? And it's got to be more than just want to improve, improve peace. So, it's a, so that'd be where I'd start. So I think there isn't enough training on peace. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, but yeah. But to some extent, the training on peace quite often gets caught up with morals. Okay, it's about sort of a, yeah, having a particular set of morals is what makes, is, is what peace is about, or a particular set of values. And somehow there's a need to transcend that in many ways. And so there are basic things which lead to peace, like empathy, okay? But, no, but they're really, really a couple of basic, really basic human emotions. So in school, if you want to create peace, I'd be more about creating, working out how to improve empathy. And that is a very, very difficult thing to do. Because in many ways, our societies don't teach us to be empathetic. They teach us to have judgment and not forget. 
okay? Someone should always be punished for the crimes they did 30 years ago. And punish the, so we set an example so other people won't do it again. That's not empathy. Uh, uh, now, back to what we do, we've got a whole range of courses. So we, we've got an online course called Positive Peace Academy. It takes about four hours to do, to train people on positive peace. We've got the uh, courses on the uh, positive, uh, on religion and peace, which we run through, let's say, groups like uh, Religions for Peace, Affinity and other organisations. Uh, we've also got IEP ambassadors. I think we're up to about 4,000 ambassadors now we've trained. So they get trained, so they can go and give presentations on our work and other things like that. So that's most of the training we do. We also we do we have positive peace workshops. They've been a little bit harder in the COVID era, but they'll be training people so they can go out and implement uh, your positive peace as a framework, let's say in a development setting and other places. And then we've got other sorts of trainings too, which sort of, we do within Rotary. There's a group there called Peace Activators, and we train them up on our model. Then they go out and then they're pushing that out through all the various clubs through Rotary. So there'd be some of the examples and just some of the thoughts around it. Having worked with some of your um, peace, IEP peace ambassadors, I mean, they're, they're great sort of young people, really evangelical about it and uh, spreading the word that way. Um, it's a fantastic uh, network. Um, we're pretty much out of time. It's been a really interesting conversation and um, I'm very grateful to, to both Steve and Sabina for joining us in their various... Uh, locations to and time zones to um, to discuss some of these things. Um, if you um, if you want to go and learn more from Steve's book, the link is in the chat box. Um, it's very readable, um, and I think these kind of uh, personal perspectives and stories about not just what peace is, but how you actually can do it, uh, bring it down to the realm of the everyday, are, are really helpful. Um, there's also a plea from my colleague Dave about uh, feedback forms, so please let us know what you think of events like this, and I think there's a question in there about um, uh, other kinds of discussions. But for the moment, um, thank you both to Steve and Sabina and uh, to everybody who joined us, and wherever you are, uh, whatever time of day in the world, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye. <laughs>